the sixth key idea in the Christian worldview. While we were created in God's image to be in relationship with him and to serve him, we rejected God's authority over us and we assumed that authority for ourselves. This act of rebellion and rejection led to our alienation from God and it disturbed all the other relationships that God had placed us in. Our relationship with other people is disturbed. Our relationship with the creation itself, with the environment and also our relationship with ourselves is disturbed. And this accounts for much of the pain, suffering and dislocation that we experience socially, internationally, emotionally and psychologically in ourselves and ecologically. Some of you may have seen the TV miniseries Angels in America or perhaps you might have seen the earlier play. It explores this pain and suffering in contemporary society through the experience of two men dying of AIDS and a couple whose marriage collapses because of sexual confusion and childhood abuse. It's a rather depressing kind of play really. In a scene towards the end, Pryor, one of the men dying of AIDS, in a kind of hallucinatory dream sequence, ascends a ladder to heaven. But what he discovers there is a sort of elegant classical ruin. The angels are still going about their work busily, filing and doing all sorts of things. But God is absent. He's not there. And in an impassioned speech to the angels, Pryor says, there's no use waiting for God. He's gone and he's not coming back. He has abandoned us. And in the unlikely event that he does return, then sue him. Sue him for abandoning us to all the pain and suffering of the 20th century. Now remember this play was written just as the first implications of the AIDS epidemic were having their full expression in America. Now this bleak and angry reaction to our human dilemma is the logical place that one arrives at if you have rejected God or your belief in God has died. A Christian response to Pryor's angry speech to the angels would be this. Pryor, your dilemma is the result not of God abandoning us, but of us abandoning God. So to summarise this sixth feature, we have rejected God's authority over our lives and this has led to our alienation and the tragic side of human history. Seventh key idea of the Christian worldview. In spite of our rejection or indifference, God continues to love us. And he has taken an extraordinary initiative to rescue us that is completely unique. He enters our human history. He becomes in the person of Jesus fully human with all our frailty and vulnerability. He identifies with us in our pain and suffering, our joy and our pleasure, our experience of evil and violence and injustice and finally submits himself to torture and death on an instrument of Roman execution in the first century, a cross. Now God takes this unique and extraordinary action for a number of reasons. Firstly, to demonstrate his relentless love for us in spite of our rejection of him. Secondly, to demonstrate that he understands us and our situation and our suffering and our human dilemma. He comes and identifies with us. Thirdly, to reveal himself to us in a way 
that we can actually understand and recognize God with a human face. And fourthly, to deal with the issue of our accountability. Our accountability for our rejection of Him and His law and the consequent results in human suffering and ecological destruction. And so He gives His life in our place to atone for our sins. This is the meaning of His death. This is the meaning of the cross in the Christian worldview. And this makes it possible for us to now approach God, to receive His grace and His forgiveness, to receive it freely and to be restored to a relationship with Him of love and obedience. And this is the reason Jesus makes unique and exclusive claims about Himself. Claims that many people find difficult. Let me quote Jesus himself from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. Jesus said, I praise you, Lord and Father of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Or again from John's Gospel. Thomas, one of his disciples, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip, another disciple, said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And speaking of the reason for his life and death, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now these are very extraordinary claims. And they are very challenging claims. And many people find them difficult in today's world. But consider the life of Jesus. In Jesus' life and teaching, in his acceptance of suffering on behalf of others, we see an extraordinary example of the truth and the goodness of the love of God. We see it expressed in a way that is extremely powerful, attractive and compelling. His teaching has unique and universal moral power. No one disagrees with that. His compassion for the sick, the poor and the marginalised is inspiring. His indignation with injustice and hypocrisy has an incredibly challenging authenticity to it. His self-sacrifice and dignity in suffering and death is a compelling example. And these have always drawn people from all cultures to him. C.S. Lewis observed that in the face of Jesus' life and in the face of his own claims about himself, we are really left with only three options. Firstly, that he was brilliant but deranged. Or secondly, that he was deliberately misleading and dishonest. And yet, all the evidence of his life is against these two conclusions. And so we are left with a third option, that he is who he claimed to be.